Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for um, joining me today. We're going to be talking about energy monitoring and energy benchmark tests um, and various GitOps uh, architectures uh, and looking at Flux and Argo CD as well. I'm Nikki Manoledaki. Um, I'm a software engineer at Waveworks, and um, I'm also a maintainer of, of Open GitOps and a contributor to the environmental sustainability tag of the CNCF. Um, my co-presenter, Al Hussein, um, wasn't able to make it today, unfortunately, um, but we'll hear from him uh, in the video, in the, in the video, in the presentation. So the cloud's carbon footprint, uh, there are a lot of uh, numbers out there trying to uh, estimate what this is, um, but it's difficult sometimes to find a reliable source uh, that will give you a, a definitive number, which is also a guess that is always changing and it's going to be growing continuously in the next years as well. Um, but the International Energy Agency, the IEA, has some numbers about data centers and data transmission networks, where each account for 1 to 1.5% 1 of global electricity usage, which is about 3%. There's other numbers that measure the uh, ICT industry as a whole to be around 4%. Um, but yeah, so in, in the diagram that you see here, you also see, you know, a larger diagram of global net zero targets and what that has to look like. Net zero being a reduction of 90% uh, or more of uh, greenhouse gas uh, and other carbon emissions, where 10% only can be offset. So the 90% reduction cannot be through offsets. And so let's go a little bit deeper in this conversation on energy and carbon monitoring and optimization in the cloud native uh, ecosystem. Um, there's some drivers and market in the market, such as net zero. A lot of companies have these in place and other sustainability targets. Um, so that means reducing the energy uh, usage and carbon emissions of your infrastructure. There's performance optimizations to be gained from energy efficiency, as well as cost savings, um, also you know, um, encompassed by the term FinOps, where you can deduce that if you reduce your resource uh, utilization and cloud usage, um, through cost optimizations that may be uh, a proxy metric for uh, sustainable uh, metrics. And there is also regulatory drivers. Um, in the US, the Security and Exchange Commission, uh, the SEC, has an upcoming uh, rule called the Climate Disclosure uh, Rule, which will require publicly traded companies to report on their carbon emissions. Um, scope one, scope two, and scope three. That's direct, indirect, and embedded emissions. And in the EU, there's already been um, a, a law that's passed and is going to take 18 months to be implemented. And that's the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, or CSRD. That's going to also require companies, especially publicly traded large companies, to report on their carbon emissions. And if you want to hear more about this, the Green Software Foundation, which is part of the Linux Foundation, has a great podcast called Environment Variables, amazing name. And one episode is on the legislation aspect of this um, and how it will impact t the tech industry and the, the cloud industry and cloud users as well. So there's a lot of community momentum at the moment in the CNCF. There's the environmental sustainability tag, uh, which meets twice monthly, and you're very welcome to come and contribute and learn. And there's also in the GitOps uh, working group, we have the environmental sustainability uh, chapter or subgroup where we well, actually this talk came out of that. Um, and you're also very welcome to, to join us to, if you would like to do more of the tests that we're going to be talking about here. And last but not least, there's, well, there's the Green Software Foundation, 
um, and that I'm going to talk about more in a minute. And the Project Silva, which is a new project by uh, Linux Foundation Europe, which is uh, focused on telcos uh, and how to measure and reduce the energy consumption of, of especially 5G uh, architectures using cloud-native software. Um, so about the Green Software Foundation, let's go, let's zoom in a little bit deeper as well before we get into why energy benchmark tests matter. The Green Software Foundation has been working on the Software Carbon Intensity Index, the SCI, which they're uh, in the process of, of making into an ISO standard for measuring the energy consumption and carbon emissions and as a rate of a software component. So there's a formula that they have um, put together with various variables such as energy consumption, um, uh, carbon emissions, embedded carbon, and all of this per rate. So per rate of, of something such as a, it, this could be an API uh, request, it could be uh, a reconciliation like what we were going to see in this in a minute. Um, so that's really important um, for comparing the software intensity, uh, the carbon intensity of software. And there are many open source tools available for measuring energy consumption, as well as uh, the hyperscalers uh, have some offerings as well for measuring carbon emissions with, through carbon dashboards. Um, the, these offerings are very limited. Um, there's definitely an issue with data granularity. Like you can't necessarily on, on uh, AWS, for example, you can't set a tag and view your carbon emissions via a tag. You see your entire infrastructure. You can see by region, which is helpful, but you can't really you know, deduce a single EC2 instance what it consumes, for example, which is what we need. Um, and there's a three month lag. So uh, if you, whatever you're running today, you're going to have the carbon emission of it in three months from now. But it's helpful for the long term uh, reporting. And in the open source side of things, there's still a lot of guesstimating, um, but Kepler is what we're going to look at today. Uh, it's an eBPF based tool. So it's uh, Kepler stands for Kubernetes based efficient power level exporter. And um, it's a great acronym as well. Um, and it's a Prometheus exporter. So it looks at uh, your kernel syscalls. That's the eBPF part. Um, and it looks at various components such as um, uh, it, well, it uses the REPL for energy uh, aggre data aggregation um, and also other components uh, that are in, in the kernel to aggregate all of that and provide uh, energy consumption in joules. Joules is a metric for energy. Joules over time is, a, is what? So if you look at joules over, for example, two hours, you're going to get the watt equivalent, which you can use with a carbon coefficient for a given uh, electricity grid to get, to multiply that with that coefficient and get the carbon uh, emissions uh, for your software. And so, yeah, eBPF for monitoring is, is really cool um, and it's a growing topic as well. And so in Prometheus, what you end up having is this Kepler container joules total which is amazing, it's magic. So the test environment set up for these tests have included Ubuntu and Arch Linux. Um, so uh, very painful, I was <laughs> using Arch for this. Uh, it's, it, it, it hurts a little bit sometimes, um, but it's trying to do this on a Mac was very difficult, even in a VM, um, doesn't help, yeah, it's, it's challenging, uh, but on Linux, it's much easier. Um, we used Minikube um, to create uh, the cluster environment with a CPU count of four, and uh, three is also possible, but it did, 
run out of, yeah, compute power sometimes um, and crash my machine multiple times. Um, but we then used Prometheus, Grafana, and then the magic, the secret sauce, Kepler, uh, to measure Flux and Argo operations. So idle GitOps, dashboard number one. Um, over two hours, uh, we can see uh, the Flux system namespace and the Argo CD namespace um, without anything, anything to reconcile, so just idle. Uh, we can see that uh, Argo CD is uh, consuming slightly more energy consumption at a base level, and we can also see that the Flux system, Flux has some spikes. Now, any guesses as to what that may be caused by? Controller. Customized controller. <laughs> yeah, very close. Um, so you see those spikes, uh, and so yeah, there's uh, a little bit of a different pattern that we can already see. Now, my co-speaker, Al Hussein, will present a little bit more about the, the benchmark test and the architectures. Thank you, Nikki. Hello, everyone. Today, I would like to take you through the experiment scenarios we conducted to evaluate the energy footprint of a set of GitOps architectures and patterns, which are, first, we examine the concurrent deployment of a sample application with Argo CD and Flux. Next, we compare the power consumption of deploying applications from a monorepo versus a multi-repo approach. Moving on, we explored the impact of using a standalone cluster versus a happen and spoke or multi-cluster setup for Argo City. And lastly, we vary the reconciliation interval comparing a three-minute interval with a 30-minute interval. For each of those, the hour-long test start with having the groups tool in an idle state for the first 15 minutes to ensure a stable starting point before deploying an application. After another 15 minutes elapse, a code change is introduced to trigger an update, followed by rollback after 15 minutes. At the end of the hour, the application and the GitOps tool get deleted. Now let's dive into the architecture of the first scenario, in which we aim to evaluate the energy footprint of deploying the guestbook sample application to a Minikube cluster, using both Argo CD and Flux simultaneously but to do at different spaces. Um, the reason why is to independently deploy and manage the application using the set tools. The power consumption in the Flux namespace remained relatively consistent throughout the hour, hovering around uh, 0.1 Watt. However, there were periodic spikes observed approximately every 10 minutes or so, which uh, could be potentially attributed to Flux internal operations, such as uh, synchronizing with Git repository or checking for changes in the application's configuration. On the other hand, within the Argo CD namespace, we observed a different power consumption pattern. Initially, the power consumption started just below 0.1 Watt. However, after approximately 15 minutes, there was a spike when the sample application was deployed. Furthermore, after another 10 minutes, the power consumption in the Argo CD namespace increased to 0.3 watts and remained at that level for the rest of the hour. The sustained increase in power consumption in the Argo CD namespace may be linked to the ongoing activities performed by the Argo CD application controller. The analysis of all namespaces reveals interesting insights. Notably, the cube system namespace exhibits significantly higher power consumption compared to the other namespaces, which can be connected to various um, system components and processes that are essential for the functioning of the Kubernetes cluster, such as kubelets, kube proxy, and other control plane components. On the other hand, the GitOps tools demonstrate much lower power consumption. Similarly, Kepler itself also shows lower power consumption, which suggests that its overall footprint is relatively minimal. In our second experiment scenario, we focus on comparing the energy footprint and impact of code repository strategies, namely monorepo and multi-repo. 
For the monorepo approach, we deploy both guestbook and podinfo sample applications from a single Git repository. This means that all necessary configuration files, Helm charts, are stored in a single Git repository. In contrast, for the multi-repo approach, we deploy the sample applications from two separate Git repositories. Each application has its own dedicated repository containing its Helm chart. It appears that it's not of, um, much of a change in the power consumption between the two approaches. The power consumption in both Argo CD and Flux system namespaces remains relatively consistent, regardless whether um, the applications are deployed from a single or multiple repositories. This implies that the choice of repository strategy does not seem to have a significant impact on the power consumption when it comes to deploying applications following a GitOps model. Um, Argo CD repo server seems to have um, peaks when there is an update uh, to the code in the Git repository, which happens around every 15 minutes, which is the sleep time that we have set in the experiment um, script. Uh, while Argo CD application controller is the one most of the power consumption is attributed to. In our third experiment scenario, we investigate and compare two architectures, standalone, a single cluster, and have on a spoke for multiple clusters architecture with Argo CD. In the standalone approach, we deploy a sample application to a single cluster, specifically a Minikube cluster, where Argo CD is installed. In contrast, the have on a spoke approach involves deploying the same application to multiple clusters, two IKS clusters besides the Minikube cluster. We utilize Argo CD's application set feature for this purpose, which allows us deploying and managing um, the applications across multiple clusters. In the case of multiple clusters deployment using uh, the HAP and Spoke architecture, it appears that Argo CD consumes close to twice as it does when it deploys to a single cluster. The increased power consumption um, in the multi-cluster scenario can be linked to factors inherent to the happen spoke architecture. Managing deployments across multiple clusters requires additional resources, resulting in higher energy consumption. Regarding Flux, Niki will explain why it's not included for now. Over to you, Niki. Yay, thank you, Al Hussein, who is definitely here among us right now. Um... <laughs> thank you, Niki. Oh. Oh, no, Hello, no, no, no. everyone. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so um, why did we not include Flux in the single cluster versus multi-cluster experiments? Primarily due to time constraints, but also because doing so, um, the equivalent would be to use, for example, Cluster API. Cluster API, if uh, this is new to you, is a way to create a management cluster and then create a bunch of workload clusters that kind of copy what is happening in the management cluster. So you can manage a fleet of clusters that way. And it's also very GitOps compatible because it, you can um, configure everything with manifests in a Git, in a Git repo. So um, Cluster API and Flux is a great combination of tools to use together. Um, but part of why I I could literally not run this on my local machine um, because it's 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 very resource intensive. I had just a, like Lenovo ThinkPad 13 to work with, and using the cloud would, for example, require using um, Cluster API for uh, Amazon, the Amazon provider, which works with EKS. Um, and full disclosure, I was previously a maintainer of EKS CTL, the CLI for EKS, and I've been researching which uh, AMI, the image for the node to use, like the operating system that would be the most ideal for running Kepler on the cloud, which is, it's very challenging again because of the eBPF constraints and you need your kernel headers to be exposed in a read-only secure way um, and you need C groups v2 and so you you really need quite a lot of um, 
configuration in order to run Kepler on the cloud, and it hasn't been done yet. Um, but yes, the last uh, reconciliation um, scenario that we tested was trying three minutes versus 30 minutes of uh, reconciliation interval. Um, and the results for that were like slightly, I'm not sure if it's what we expected for Flux. For Argo, you, you do see um, uh, a decrease. Um, so there is some optimization there. Um, for Flux, not so much. And actually what we realized is that we were testing the reconciliation for specific resources, like Git sources and Helm sources, but um, this is not the same as re reconciling everything um, according to these intervals. And Kings and my colleague had a made had made a really good comment that sometimes optimization are not that and they may actually be misconfiguration. So we have to be really careful with, with that, so that optimizations don't you know, stop us from using a tool the way, um, in, the, in the most optimal way. Um, so other GitOps architectures that we want to try, like I mentioned before, is to use it with cluster API to run it on EKS. Um, and pull-based versus push-based reconciliation would also be really interesting to try. So some of the challenges and lessons learned. The operating system is an, an, an eBPF portability is something that is very challenging and it's quite well documented. Um, I recommend this article by folks from Pixie who also work with eBPF on the challenges of deploying eBPF in the wild and accommodating various different operating systems uh, and how difficult that can be. Um, so like I mentioned before, we use Linux machines and Mac OS is pretty challenging. Um, the Kepler does support uh, VMs, uh, but it's, it's still, I, it, I've, I've tried with Kind, I've tried with Minikube, I've tried with VirtualBox um, and no luck so far, so. Um, hopefully one day. Um, that would make the dev end much easier for Mac users, otherwise you need to be to also have a Linux machine. Um, resource limitations, like I said, the test environment for running all of these tools and all of these operations can be really intensive. So again, dev environment is a challenge um, for, for, for this um, and or machines like we had to try all of this so many times because sometimes we just had Kepler not returning any data and the Grafana dashboard was literally just five dots. So we can really show you that. Um, and it's, it's, it, our system often became unresponsive and we had to start over and so it's, it can be really difficult. Um, and cloud limitations, so we really should be trying all of this on in the cloud, right? Um, currently, there's no support for EKS. If there is interest in doing that or solving for any of these challenges, please do um, contribute to to the the uh, sustainability subgroup of the of Open GitOps. Um, and and lastly, um, oh, and but Kepler is supported by OpenShift. Kepler is a tool that is developed by Red Hat and IBM primarily. Um, so there is support for OpenShift. Um, and some statistical limitations is that we need way more data points because we can show you, you know, a couple of examples of or averages, but ultimately we need way more data points um, so that we can have actual uh, information uh, that has been tested on different uh, environments um, hundreds of times, ideally, um, and uh, for much longer periods of time as well, um, so that we can have, yeah, a, a better picture of, of what the energy consumption of, of the software is. So you can try it yourself. Um, there is, uh, if you can scan this QR code or go to visit um, this page, you will see 
scripts for how to run all of this yourself. Um, and we are planning to move all of this work to the Open GitOps uh, organization on, on GitHub very soon. So that's going to be uh, something that you can also help to maintain and spread the word and contribute to and measure whichever tool you are uh, uh, building or maintaining, using, etc. And um, lastly, the environmental sustainability tag of the CNCF is going to be meeting on Wednesday um, around 12.45 uh, outside of Sustainability Con's room, very targeted <laughs> um, room location. Um, but if you're interested in um, talking more and joining the tag, you're very welcome to join us there. Um, and uh, also attend some sustainability contact, uh, talks if you're at OSS um, in the next days. And if you scan that other QR code, you can see more talks about flux happening these days. I don't know if there's time for a question or I, any questions. Yes. No, we, we didn't compare the energy consumption for different ways of setting up your customization, um, but that's a really interesting um, test to do as well. And I don't think it would be too difficult. If The difficult part is setting up your test environments, but after that you can really measure anything that you want. Um, Okay, so the question is if flux was uh, intended to be more energy efficient from the get-go, um, given that the data shows that flux has a lower uh, energy consumption. I don't think that it was necessarily intentional. I don't think that we had this data before now um, to be able to measure things. Um, and about the, but there, there have been, um, I know there's been some performance improvements very recently. Um, so maybe that played a role. I, we haven't tested different versions, like before the optimizations and after, um, but that would also be really interesting to be able to share that kind of information. Thank you. Yes. Mm. So the question is, because you're not mic'd, the question is if we tested uh, Git submodules. We, we haven't tested that. Um, yeah, uh, what you see is everything that, that we've tested in, in uh, the past, yeah, about for this talk. Um, but that's another use case that would be really interesting. And I, I hope that we can see more features um, being tested before they're released in that way to also be able to um, show that the consumption is low compared to some that might double or triple your consumption um, and, and hopefully that becomes a, a test for the future. Yeah. Is that the eventual goal? 
Yeah, so I don't know if this was picked up, but the question is if uh, sustainability can become a topic that is as important as, for example, security, and if it can become part of the tests that we run, the auditing that we run on our software. Um, there is a lot of demand creation being created uh, uh, right now um, around sustainability in, in the cloud native ecosystem. There's a lot of questions and it's very new to a lot of people. So we're still doing a lot of education, a lot of awareness. And there's also sometimes sustainability can be kind of a buzzkill sometimes because it sounds like something, you know, that you do out of for, for what, right? And actually, there's so much that's been shown that improving sustainability can reduce financial costs. So we still have to to kind of link those together to people. There's also regulation coming that's going to require those metrics um, of whether you know this is a goal or not. And um, I've seen a lot of reports that are saying sustainability is in the top five for the years to come. Um, so I, I hope so. And maybe we can make sustainability or measuring the SCI part of the graduation process. I think that would be really interesting for the CNCF. Yes, I think we are out of time by four minutes, but there's three questions and I don't know, um, maybe we can have these questions afterwards. Sorry, I would love to, but we're a little bit behind. Thank you. <laughs>